Hello and welcome to episode 28 of MMO Weekly, presented as always by MetsmerizedOnline.com. I'm your host, Sal Manzo, joined once again this week by my co-host and MMO executive editor, Mike Mayer. Mike, we missed you last week. How's everything going, man? Uh, doing much better this week. That's good. We like to hear it. We like to hear it. Obviously, Jacob was uh, Jacob Resnick filled in last week for you. Did a great job. Um, talked about some potential pitches the Mets could be signing, you know, interest in some certain guys. And right after that, seemed like on cue, I think the next day or two after that, the Mets signed Kodai Sanga. We've talked a lot about him on the show the last few weeks. Uh, Mets get their guy five years, $75 million. Um, you know, we, we know everything about the upside that they think about this guy has. i um, excited to see what he has, you know, coming over the States and pitching. So I just want to get your re- initial reactions now to the Sanga signing and, and the Mets kind of solidifying their rotation now moving forward for 2023. Yeah. I mean, this is kind of a guy the Mets have had their eye on for a while. I think I was actually the first one to report that they had interest about a month ago in him. Um, they heavily scouted him. Um, Epler has a background in getting Japanese players. Um, and I think they just like the upside there too. And the upside and then combined with what the cost ended up being, I mean, 575 is going into this off season. What I thought Sango was going to get. Um, once we saw deals of like Taiwan Walker and some other pitchers, I, I thought Sango was pr- likely going to get close to a hundred million. Um, so I, I think the Mets got a really nice deal here. I mean, mentioning Walker and comparing him to him, I mean, the Mets are playing, paying Sanga less per year than the Phillies are going to be paying Walker. Um, I know Walker has obviously a better track record in the major leagues because Sanga has none, but I, I think Walker is basically a four on a good team. Um, I think Sanga has, like we've talked about many times, has, I think it's a good bet that he's going to be a three, four and has the upside of a two. Um, So to be able to get him at that price in this market, I think it's just tremendous value. And, and I think in part of that has to do with, look, we knew Sango wanted to be on a big big market team and he wanted to be on a team that's going to win right away. I mean, the the Mets are set up to win and eventually that's going to um, get players in here. I mean, I I'm sure Sango, potentially had similar to better offers from other teams. Um, and the Met, let's face it, the Mets are, I, I know it feels weird because a lot of us grew up in Mets land when you had Wilpons as owners and free agents, you had to pay, overpay free agents to come here. But the Cohen effect, not just as his, his money, but also his just his being a fan and wanting to get close to these players sitting down with dinner and stuff. Um, uh, that's contagious. Players want to be a part of that. The winning, um, the culture, all of that. So I think I think it's a great fit for the Mets. I think it ends up being a great fit for Sanga. And uh, yeah, I I think the Mets. I I know it's tough to say without like Degrom in the rotation, but I I think going into the 2023, I think the Mets have a better rotation than they did going into last year. And I think there's more upside to it, too. I mean, we basically knew what a guy like Bassett was, what Walker was, what Carrasco was, um, and Scherzer and DeGrom. I mean, you're, you're likely going to get – it would take a pretty bad injury for the Mets to get fewer innings out of Verlander than they did from DeGrom last year. And I think Sanga, I think it's pretty – I think you can expect a him to be Bassett. Um or better. I, I think I, again, I think he has the higher upside of Bassett and Bassett got significantly more money per year than Sanga ended up with. And you, that pushes Quintana to the four, or, I mean, however they decide to go at three, four, I mean, Quintana, I mean, he's not a guy that's striking out a ton of people, but he had an ERA under three last year. Um, he limited runs pretty well. And he's been a guy that's every year, goes out there and makes a start. So, I mean, to have a guy like that as your fourth starter and uh, Carrasco pitched well last year too, to have him as your five. Uh, David Peterson's the best six in baseball. I mean, then you got a wild card in like Tyler McGill to see what he can do there and Joey Lucchese. I mean, the one through eight the Mets have now is just ridiculously good. Um, I know there's been some talk of 
will they potentially trade Carrasco? Um, yeah, I mean, I think that's out there. If they can get a, other pieces that they need, why not use Carrasco as a chip? I mean, at one year, $14 million, that's that's pretty cheap. If there's a team out there that doesn't want to go multiple years on a starting pitcher, that that's a nice little piece. Um, but I, I think I think that would either have happened, say, they sign Carlos Correa, or B, they wait in the offseason and they don't get some of the other pieces they wanted to. But yeah, I, I, I mean, right now, before he pitches, I would have to say the Senga deal is an A. Plus. I mean, I, I don't think you can look at it any other way. Yeah, you know, it seems like with the upside and what the Mets really like, and, and like you were talking about before, it, it sounded like he had um, other offers. I think it might have been the Padres that, that I read or actually offered him more, but he wanted to come to New York. He wanted to come, like you said, win now team, a big market. Obviously, the Cohen effect here is real, and like you mentioned with Epler and his background and signing players from Japan, I think it was a perfect storm. Um you also mentioned Chris Bassett, who the other day signed a three-year, $63 million deal with the Toronto Blue Jays. Um, were you surprised by that deal at all, just as far as years-wise? I thought he'd be looking for maybe a four- or five-year contract, like in the length of a Senga. Were you surprised that he only took the three years? Um, and at that, I, obviously the AAV is more per year with it being less years, but with that price point at 63, you, do you think the Mets made the right move going with the higher upside in Senga or with you know seeing the deal that Bassett you know, got, were you a little surprised that maybe they didn't go after Bass a little harder instead? No, I, I think they made the right move in between those two. I mean, obviously Bassett is more of the sure deal, but he's, he's also going to be 34 next year. Um, and the Mets, the Mets wanted to get younger. I mean, Sanga's 29. Um, they already, they already went out and got Verlander, who's going to be 40. Scherzer's 38. Carrasco's 36. Quintana's 34. Uh at some point, and so, I mean, at some point you want to get a little bit younger where Senga is. And he also, I mean, it'd be nice to have some guys under control in four or five years. So yeah. I, th I think the Mets like that part of it too, because other than Senga, you're talking about the longest contract is two years of right. any of the other starters. So Senga is the only guaranteed guy you have there for the 2025 season. So I, I think that's a good piece of it too. Um, yeah, I think Sanga all the way between those two and um Bass hey, Bassett pitched well for the Mets. Um and that's a good deal for him. I mean, for him to be able to get twenty one million with the um draft pick compensation attached to him. I I was a little surprised he was still able to get that, but uh good for him. And I mean it, I guess it did it does make sense considering like we talked about with the other numbers we've seen for starters. And I I just think when you look at Bassett, Walker, I mean, some of the other deals starters get it. It really does make that Sanga deal look that much better. And it really does. It makes the Verlander deal not that crazy for what he got coming off Cy Young year. I just, I mean, look at Rodon. He just got six years, 162 million, literally right before we came on the show. And uh, while Rodon has been very good the last two years, previous to that, it's um, four or five seasons of not very good slash been injured. So pitching's at a premium and it's, it's costing a lot. So I get going back to it. I, I just think the Sanga deal is a home run. True. And you know, another factor that I think about, and you tell me if you think there's any truth to this at all, do you think that the signing of Sanga is also a, kind of a preemptive move for next year for Shohei Otani, just trying to, dip their toes in the Japanese market, so to speak, kind of, you know, gear up a year early with obviously not Otani, but, you know, a great Japanese player in the own right. And, you know, try and maybe lure them here to feel a little more comfortable and start getting their, their games broadcast in Japan. Now I know, you know, that whole deal with TV, you know, gets bigger now bringing in players like that. I'm just wondering if you think that there was any, like, um, uh, if there's any validity to that, you know, as far as trying to also bring in Senga to maybe, you know, help them lure Otani next year. I mean, I think it certainly doesn't hurt. Um, Senga's played against Otani before. Mm -hmm. I I know one of the highlights they showed like immediately after the Mets signed him was him was uh, Senga striking out Otani on a nasty splitter before he came over to the U.S. So yeah, I mean it can't hurt. Um, we like we talked about Epler has that experience with Otani, um, and let's face it, um, assuming Otani hits free agency, there's what. 
five teams that can afford him. Right. I mean, both New York teams, Dodgers, uh, the Red Sox aren't out there anymore with their budget. Um, the Giants just spent on their big guy with Correa. Um, the Padres spent on a couple of big guys. So, I mean, maybe it's not even five teams. Maybe it's like Mets, Yankees, Dodgers. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, that's – and the Yankees just spent $360 million on Judge and $160 million on Rodon. So maybe we're mostly talking about the Mets versus Dodgers here. I mean, that honestly wouldn't surprise me if that's what it turns out to be. Um, and I think – I mean, from all that we've heard and everything, I think Cohen is absolutely interested. We know Epler wants Otani. Um, I have to imagine Otani is going to want to go to a team that's – position to win now after basically playing in a desert out there in the angels, a wind desert with the angels. So you have to imagine he's going to want to go to a team that wants to win. And I mean, who, like I said, who else is going to be able to fork up? I mean, he's going to get, he's getting more than judge. Mm -hmm. Um, Assuming he's healthy this year, he's going to be over 400 million. I got to pay for two players. That's never, never, never been done before. Probably never will. No, no. And I mean, let's face it, too. I mean, not that he doesn't fit every team, but um, let's say the Mets still don't have DH locked Mm -hmm. up, which right now they they really don't have like a permanent solution at DH. So that's money that they would be likely spending on a DH anyway. And obviously, Otani's a great hitter. So um, then they're going to have a spot in a rotation. Carrasco is going to be a free agent. So, yeah, I mean let the let the fun begin with that and i just uh, we're talking about it so i might as well bring up the fact that i they'll still think the angels are just nuts for holding on to them right now uh, i agree there I, again we know that ownership is a thing now you know that art, art moreno is probably going to be selling the next year you know i guess it depends on philosophy some teams want to try and sell with an asset there the Nationals decided they didn't want to do that when they traded Soto and then sold the tea. It's all, I guess, you know, whatever your cup of tea is. But you think at this point you'd want to try and get the most value that you can. And I would assume if you trade them, you know, with a full season as opposed to a half a season, it's going to always be, you know, the, the more control that a team's going to have is going to have more. I agree. It's also crazy that you have two of the best players in the sport and you can't sniff, you know, like 500. That That's another crazy thing. But, you know, hopefully you won't have to worry about that, you know very much uh very soon after no matter who it is but um you mentioned the dodgers i i have been reading that too as far as like they've had a pretty quiet off season they signed noah Syndergaard today one year 13 million dollar deal actually probably shouldn't be you know a bad get for them at the back end of the rotation there for them um but that's the rumblings that they're you know holding off because they want to go after otani next year obviously it's a year for now anything can happen like you said injuries different things who knows um, but it's just fun to talk about, fun to speculate, because, you know, like we know now the Mets are or the big players around. They're the big dogs in town. So any big player they're going to get linked to. And speaking of that, the Mets were linked the other night to a guy you mentioned, Carlos Correa, for like an hour. Uh, you know, I think he was in Met for about an hour and a half. You know, that was a lot of fun. We can remember those good times. Um, but obviously you mentioned he got the huge deal by the Giants. I think 13 years, $350 million, uh, Biggest shortstop deal in MLB history now, past uh, Lindor's. Um, just want to get your thoughts, I guess, twofold on the Mets being in on Correa, at the, you know, when that all happened and then him eventually signing with the Giants. Were you, were you happy that the Mets kind of, I don't want to say missed out because they, it sounded like they came in late, whether it was posturing or not, right. That they were just trying to get more, his camp was trying to get more money out of the Giants, but just wondering where you stood on the whole Correa thing. If you would have been happy if the Mets made a splash like that and just, you know, what you think of the deal now with the Giants in general. Yeah, so on Correa, so I had actually heard that the Mets had talked to Boris about 24 hours, actually, before I actually reported it. Um, I was trying to confirm with more sources, giving kind of, I mean, the severity of that news. I uh, was being a little more diligent with uh, my reporting, and I finally got it confirmed by two other sources, and... I, I was typing it up as Ken Rosenthal put out his piece. Um, so Rosenthal, I think, beat me by like 11 seconds or something crazy. But um, so I, for me personally, I do not have any Boris ties, links, sources, anything like that. Um, most of the people I talk to are from the Mets organization. Um, so this, 
this wasn't posturing, I don't think. I think the Mets had legit interest in Correa. Um, I think it was more assuming that this type of deal wasn't going to happen. Um, so they wanted to check in on the market. I mean, let's face it, he he was the best um, player on the market at right. that point. And we are talking about the Steve Cohen Mets now. So nothing's off the table. So, and let's face it, third base is wide. I mean, third base could be wide open. I mean, they have Escobar there for a year, but you could trade him slash you could go to a bench roll. Um, Beatty, Beatty could shift to the outfield or you spend his year in AAA and then you trade him for a bat. Different, different scenarios. But yeah, I mean, it would have been easy to see where they could put Correa. They could just put him at third base, which we know that he talked about being fine with back in 2017 uh, when he did for the WBC with Lindor. So uh, I, th- I think it was real interest from the Mets part. And I think if it was um, just being leaked to drive up the price or, um, from the Boris standpoint, I think it probably would have came out sooner. So I don't really right. think that holds much weight. Um, yeah. And I, I, I think, I think it's more symbolic of just what the Mets are now yep. um, that they're going to be in on just about everyone. Um, and that's the way it should be on a big market team. If there's a guy that could potentially fit on your team, you should be in on him. Um, you should be willing to spend that money or at least talk to that player and his agent and see if it's a fit. Right. Um, I think that certainly makes sense for Correa to finally get the long-term deal. I mean, he took essentially what turned out to be a one-year deal last year yep. and played well for the Twins. So he finally saw his chance to – make a home for the rest of his career. And that's what he did. I, I think the Mets would have definitely wanted to be in a shorter term deal. Um, and that, I think that kind of just shows you too, that the Mets aren't done um, right. offensively. I, I do think they're going to sign another bat. Um, obviously there's nothing of Correa's ilk left right. Right. and there's really nothing left at third base that would kind of force you to, um, do stuff with Escobar and Beatty. Um, you're not signing Dan B. Swanson and putting right. him at third base. He's not the offensive player that Correa is. So uh, I think that was just an option that they were like, hey, this might be something that works out. And it didn't. And uh, you go to the next thing on the drawing board. Yeah. And, you, you know, you alluded to, and I think for me, the biggest takeaway is what you said as far as the Mets are just if there's a, a big player, you know, an impact player that they think could be a fit and help their club, they're going to look into it. And I think that's the biggest takeaway. I agree there. I think from a baseball standpoint, even if it was a shorter term deal, I would assume he would have been in like the five, six year range, something like that. And ultimately with the dollar wise, it probably would have been, you know, somewhere over 200 million. I would think something like that. Right. You know, big deal. And I would think ultimately if you sign a Carlos Correa, it probably would mean the end in a couple of years of, re-signing an, uh, McNeil or an Alonzo. Uh, that would be, that was my kind of first thought. So I think long-term wise, I think it's probably better off that they, you know, end up, didn't end up with Correa. Obviously in, in, in the near future, it would have been great, whatever. But I think it probably would have hindered them a little bit long-term as far as keeping some of their core guys around the next couple of years. Um, but, you know, from the standpoint of, like you said, they're in on every big name. They should be. And uh, it's refreshing to see. So, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm happy from that standpoint. And you mentioned, you know, it's a good transition here as far as Mets are probably looking at other hitters. Two names that keep kind of popping up now for the Mets as far as, you know, uh, more value deals to come in and get a little more thump in the middle of the lineup uh, is Michael Conforto and J.D. Martinez. Um, I just wondering what you think. Obviously, both those guys in this kind of role. Uh, Martinez, I'm assuming, would probably just strictly be a DH. You don't want him anywhere in the outfield, ever play in the field. But for, you know, a, a more veteran deal one year, guy that can come in if he's healthy and, and help right away. And then Conforto, we, we're seeing reports as far as he wants a one- or two-year deal with the club, obviously wants to build his value back up. Um, i just wondering if you think that, you know, either of those guys would still be a fit if you think Conforto will come here as a fourth outfielder at this point, whatever. I'm just curious what you think of those two guys. I mean, I think both of them are fits in um, just a quick look. I mean, obviously, one of the things the Mets need right now is someone who hits left-handers well, um, ideally from the DH spot because they have Vogel back who won't play against lefties whatsoever. So Martinez fits that bill. I mean, he's older, had some back issues last year, and kind of struggled overall, but he still hit lefties well. 
OPS right. just under a thousand against lefties last year. Um, that's what he's always done. I mean, he's always hit both hands well, but last year he struggled against righties a little bit. Um, yeah, I mean, on a one year type deal, I think he, he definitely makes the Mets better. Um, the issue you get with signing him and having Vogel back and potentially having a third catcher. And mm -hmm. now you're getting into the point where you almost have virtually no versatility on your bench right. whatsoever. Right. So I, I think that's kind of the issue you have with Martinez is just the lack of versatility and, and age and his backer consideration. Um, Conforto, I think there's a great fit from the Met standpoint. Um, just take away all of the – he's he wasn't as good in his Mets last year. Um, health, he didn't play last year because of an injury. Uh, the Mets have – after Nimmo, Canna, and Marte, they have Khalil Lee, who they mm -hmm. tried to trade at the deadline last year and just essentially no one wanted. And then they have no one. Um, I mean, next on the depth chart is like Carlos Cortez – who had a really bad year last year in the minors. Um, really, right now, the Mets' fourth outfielder is Jeff McNeil. Mm. I mean, he's essentially their – if they need an outfielder, he's the guy that's got to play. So that just gives you an idea of um, where their depth is right now. There's no outfield depth. Um, so Conforto obviously improves that. Um, and let's face it, the corner guys are Marte and Canna, particularly – I mean, Canna's obviously the lesser of the two there, and he's a right-handed bat, so Conforto would complement him well. Mm -hmm. um, and it would also give the Mets another option at DH. If Vogelback doesn't play well, then you have Conforto right. as an option. Um, I think in terms of a deal, it would be a rather cheap deal. I mean, one year, 12, 14 million, two years, right. 24 million, something like that, and incentives, opt-outs. Different create. I mean, Boris is going to get creative with it. Um, I think probably the thing that makes it so Conforto doesn't happen is he's going to look for playing time. I mean, right. and why wouldn't he? Um, I think it's much better for him, given that he missed last year, to go to a team where they're just going to put him in right field every day and he's just going to play. Right. Um, I think that's obviously a better fit for him than coming to the Mets and essentially being like a – third-ish, fourth outfielder, DH split time, maybe get 350 at-bats where he can sign with, I don't know, even like a team like the Astros need right. an outfielder. Um, the, uh, not the Mariners. Uh, Rockies, um, Marlins. I mean, there's a lot of teams that could just give him that deal and plug him in for 500 right. at-bats. And I also, I mean – we talked about it with DeGrom a little bit, how he, he was not, I don't necessarily think he wanted out of New York, but he was fine with the thought of leaving New York and getting away from the New York media. That's, that's kind of where Conforto was at too. I mean, that was, that was a topic last year and it's kind of faded away because um, it just, his market never really materialized and right. he got hurt. But right. uh, Conforto was a guy that really wasn't keen on coming back to New York for, I mean, a lot of the same reasons as DeGrom. I mean, he, people don't like, some players don't like playing in New York with the press and everything and just the, the, how harsh the fans are at times. I mean, the, the different stuff that comes with playing in New York and let's face it. He, he was a guy that, I mean, if healthy, I think the Mariners would have made a run out of him last year right, to right. go out and play where he's from out that way and where he went to school. So I think, I think ultimately he's a fit for the Mets. Uh, um, I don't think he signs with the Mets and right. I don't, I don't think Martinez really ends up signing with the Mets too, unless there's other moves. I think um, other names that make more sense is a guy like Adam Duvall. Okay. Um, He's a guy that I've been talking to folks with recently, and he just makes a ton of sense because, yeah. A, he crushes lefties, um, and, B, he can play all three outfield spots. Right. Um, he won a gold glove in 2021. Yep. He is fairly decent in center field, too. Um, and this is a guy that also hit 31 home runs two years ago. So I think um, depending on – again, that's what he might, – might be what he's looking for. He had right. kind of a down year last year, so mm -hmm. maybe – he might be in the same boat where he's looking for a one-year deal on a team right. 
looking to play um, all the time. But from a Mets standpoint, I think Duvall would be – I think he's a better fit than Conforto or Martinez simply because he can play all three outfield spots and he hits lefties well. And there's certainly power upside there. I mean, he's hit yep. over 30 home runs three different times right. in the last six seasons. So Duvall is one name I would definitely keep an eye on. And there's others too, like Trey Mancini, uh, obviously is a connection with Buck. Um, another guy that, like Martinez, hits lefties well, but he has the versatility that Martinez doesn't. Um, Mancini can play first base, and mm-hmm. he's played a little bit of the outfield too. So... Um, AJ Pollock is another one. Um, I know I I can't remember how many years ago it is now, maybe four when AJ Pollock was the big rage with Mets fans. Um, he, he didn't play. He hasn't played. Um, he's had some injury issues. He's obviously older, but, um, he showed a little pop last year. He hit lefties well, and he's a guy that's still a solid outfielder. Um, and that's what the Mets really need is someone like that. They can play all three outfield spots, preferably probably hit lefties. Well, um, if in, if he's going to be able to play some center and, um, just be a cheaper guy, that's not looking for a ton of playing time. And so I think in that respect, Pollock might be the, the better fit of all of those guys, but there, there's options out there, um, between all those guys. So the, like fourth ish outfielder market. I think if you can get those guys to sign for it, um, it's fairly deep and all of those guys would certainly help the Mets. I, I love the call on Duval. I think that would be a great fit more than even um, Pollock, just from the pop aspect. Um, like you, you know, said about Duval as a guy who's hit, you know, 30 home runs multiple times, plays a decent uh, outfield in all three spots. And he killed the Mets, especially with the Marlins and the Braves those couple of times. And when they went on that run in 2021, he was a, a you know big time for them down the stretch, and I just always remember him killing the Mets when they played them. So I would I really really like that fit. Um, yeah, actually even more so than a Conforto or Martinez, and I agree with you know kind of everything you said there. Um, but you know to kind of round everything out, I guess um, the Mets did sign an outfield. I talked about it with Jacob last week. They signed Brandon Nimmo. Obviously brought him back today. It was the press conference. Um, and then Nimmo subsequently was uh, an alpha afterwards for the holiday party. He was not Santa this year. Todd Zeal was Santa. Mm-hmm. They want to break the curse. They just give Nimmo all this money. Can't have him, you know, getting jinxed here, putting on the Santa uniform again. But uh, just want to get your, you know, as we finish up here, your thoughts on the press conference from today. Anything that, you know, stood out to you from, from Nimmo or anybody else? Yeah, I, I think just from we've talked before about how when Cohen came in and maybe he regretted not giving some of these guys um, some extensions or long-term deals that keep them as Mets. And I, I think this was, this was that, I mean, they gave Nimmo eight years. Obviously part of that was to keep his AAV down, but I mean, Brandon Nimmo's going to have started his Mets career as a teenager. And now he's, he's going to finish his career with the Mets. I mean, that's Nimmo talked about how special that was to him and just, even more so now because of the rarity of that in the game. Um, it, it just doesn't happen. And I mean, let, I mean, even less so there's, it's a very short list of guys he would be joining in the Mets organization that have spent that many years with the team. Um, I think Nimmo wanted to be a Met and they obviously wanted him given the center field market and it, it worked out. I mean, I think that was a fair deal for both sides um, and it, I think Nimmo was excited. He looked like he was excited today. Scott Boris was there with him. Um, yeah, I mean, the Met, the Mets have done a good job of filling out the roster so far. And Nimmo was just, it, I, I felt like it was such a, much like Diaz, it was just a no brainer to get it done. And, uh, it was a good thing they did for the lineup and for center field. And, uh, I, I do think it was kind of interesting that, so the last, I think it's four times the Mets have been able to have their holiday party that Nimmo was Santa and he came back today as the elf. Um, and not that this matters much, but it, it was interesting that Nimmo and Vogelback were the elves and Todd Zeal of all people was Santa. Um, people are commenting, talking about, Hey, Vogelbeck's, I mean, he's got the body for, <laughs> he's got the body for Santa already. So why not strap the guy in? Uh, but it's good. I mean, and to touch on Vogelbeck, I don't mean to 
kind of change course here. I, I think we're both pretty excited about Nimmo and know how awesome it is that he's going to essentially retire as a Met. But um, just want to touch on Vogelback. I mean, he's he's only been with the Mets for a short period, but um, today he was a part of the celebration, the holiday celebration yep. today. Um, yesterday, him and Carrasco were giving out presents to kids for that program. Um, MLB showed video of him out on um, the streets of New York today. MLB store signing autographs, giving out jerseys and stuff like that. I mean, this is just a top-notch human being. Um, and that's something we kind of forget about sometimes is we always talk about on the field stuff. And I, th- I think – we can eat, we can see that the Mets are looking at these character type guys too. With Vogelback, he's a great guy. I mean, Scherzer, Scherzer was a uh, part of the players union. He was ahead of the players union, coming in being a good guy. I mean, there's all these that Carrasco has all these great initiatives that he's done um, in his career, giving back the community. And Francisco Lindor was a finalist for that type of award this right. year. All the stuff that he does. So I think. I think the Mets have not only built a good team on the field in terms of talent, but I think they've done a good job of building a team of good character throughout the organization too. And I think that's important. Yeah. You know, I don't, I I don't like keep harping on DeGrom, but one of the things that that kept coming out that DeGrom was not very involved outside of the team, didn't do any, you know, uh, off the field activities for the Mets really and spend a lot of time in the clubhouse. Wasn't really involved at all. And, you know, I don't know if this is a point now because their star left and kind of wasn't engaged, but it seems like they want people who want to be here that want to be engaged with the Mets community, the Mets family. So I agree there, you know, they got some great people. I saw that video with Vogel back at the MLB store. That was awesome. Really cool. Seems like a genuine guy with the kids and everything that was really cool um and it's just as far as nimmo goes yeah you know it's uh i i got to watch brandon nimmo play with the cyclones his first the summer he got drafted for the mets in 2011 he was playing center field for brooklyn um and i got to to see him play that summer, which was really cool and now you know over 10 years later um you know he's a met for life now hopefully they give him the captain title i'm not someone who Loves giving that out willy nilly. I think you know not every team needs an official captain. You know that's something that that that's really a special honor. But he's someone at this point. He wanted to be here. He's going to be a Met for life. And you know he's even said whether I'm captain or not, I'm still going to be a leader. Like just because I don't have a C or whatever doesn't change it. So I just think that in itself, make him the next Max captain. He's the most at this point got to be the most tenured Met anyway. Um, now that the has gone, so you know make him the next captain. Hopefully he stays healthy. Um, cause whenever he's on the field, he's electric and he, you know, plays hard here and, and they, they go as, as him, Alonzo and, and, uh, Marte go in that lineup. Hopefully maybe they can lengthen, lengthen it out a little bit more, but you know, all good, all good stuff from Mets land here. And I just, you know, before we close up, do you have any other, uh, last comments, concerns with free agency or anything? Yeah, I think, I mean, one of the obvious needs that the Mets still have is, um, in the bullpen. Um, I still think they're going to sign a couple arms there. Uh, a couple names heard recently, Michael Fulmer. Uh, mm-hmm. Obviously, we're pretty familiar with Fulmer being from the Mets system when they trade him for uh, Cespedes. Um, just a solid bullpen arm, nothing flashy, uh, just a solid sixth, seventh inning guy. Um, Zach Britton's kind of been a name that was thrown around today. Um, reunite him with Buck. Obviously, he hasn't done much in a while, but that's the type of guy it's, it's always good to take uh, a chance on a guy like Britain mm-hmm. or a guy or two like Britain every year. I mean, there's obviously a ton of upside there and it's going to be a minimal type of contract. Um, so apparently the Mets are signing Omar Navarez, uh, okay. catcher yep. that used to be with the Brewers. Yes. Um, breaking news, breaking news, signing another catcher. Does that mean James? McKinney? Which is, yeah, is very idea? interesting. The Mets catching situation gets um, a little more crowded, even tighter. Yeah, yeah, it's getting very crowded. Uh, wow, this is and, interesting. And, and with that, too, I saw before the Mets signed Jose Peraza to a minor league deal, who the Mets know obviously from 2021. Yep. I saw that interesting. I, uh, you know, I. Definitely not carrying three catches. Definitely not carrying four. So I don't know. They're going to have to figure out something. And I would hope Tomas Nito's not the odd man out of that um, because he's someone I'd really like for them to keep along with Alvarez. But, you know, I guess we'll see what happens here. I, you got to assume something like that, that that McCann's got to be, you know, out the door here sooner rather than later. 
I, you know, I guess they got to figure out a partner, someone who maybe will take some of the money in general, or maybe they'll just hope yeah. that someone can move them. But that's uh, yeah, this that's pretty this interesting. Is a weird, it's a weird fit to say the least. Yeah. Um, it sounds like it's definitely a major league deal. So, interesting. yeah. All right. Well, I think I think that's a good way to. Yeah, close that's off a good ball on the show. I, okay, we got breaking news here. Pretty good. Interesting. Yeah, not, yeah, not, not absolutely. Any of the people I, I, we were I, talking about. Yeah, but, uh, absolutely. Is he, is he? He's a right-handed hitter, or is he switch hitter? I forget. He Navars. Um, yeah. I honestly, he's a no. He's a left-handed hitter. He's a left-handed hitter. Even more interesting. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Even okay. All right. Yeah. So I mean, I mean. That that makes a little bit more sense, but right. still, I you how, how many catchers you're going to carry, and what are you doing with Francisco Alvarez? Uh, I, yeah, right, exactly. It, yeah, may, well, man, maybe, maybe yeah, this means it, that 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 they're going to keep some control for the young man. That they're going to do, you know, I don't know. I guess we'll, that's very interesting. Could be. I, I, I guess we'll have to see the terms of it. I think once right. we see like the yep. terms of the deal, which we will see by the time the show comes out, that right. that'll give you a better idea of. Uh, exactly what their plans are for him right well uh interesting way to end the show a little, little breaking news there so we'll cap it off um we'll keep you updated any more signings happen you know but you know from between now and next week in the next episode uh but until then guys let's go mets <laughs>